Thank you everybody for joining us. We're having a webinar today. We've had two successful group meetings, one of which was a, a journal club meeting in the last two months with our new co-chair, Dr. Lisa Thompson. And we have the special guest here, Dr. Chicas, Roxana Chicas, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Emory University School of Medicine, having just graduated very recently with her PhD from the School of Nursing. She is very much interested in environmental exposures and occupational health hazards among immigrant agricultural workers. She in, considers herself a bilingual and bicultural nurse scientist, which I can totally relate to, amen. And she is very interested in understanding factors that contribute to variations in occupationally induced indicators of heat stress in particular, and examines cooling strategies for the preservation of health and enhancement of work performance. So we're very happy to have Dr. Chicas with us to review some of her work with us here at the Annie Research Work Group. Dr. Chicas. Well, thank you. <laughs> very happy to be here and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this presentation and um, being a part of your group. So I guess I'll go ahead and start uh, the presentation. Can you hear me just fine? Okay, and you can see my screen just fine, right? Okay, great. So um, so the name of the presentation is Work Health Status of Latinx Agricultural Workers in uh, Florida. And so I have been um, I just recently graduated with my uh, PhD in May, so my entire uh, pre-doctoral work was uh, with agricultural workers. My advisor was uh, the dean of uh, the School of Nursing at Emory, Linda McCauley, and um, I've had, I'm trying to build on some of the work that she has done already. So let's see. So we're going to just talk about the health status of workers, and I'll discuss a little bit about the biomonitoring methods that we use. Uh, and what we have found, and also discuss potential um, factors that influence renal health, because uh, renal health is something that we're starting to see uh, deterioration in agricultural uh, workers. So, um, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm building a little bit on the Dean's uh, research. She had a, a study called the Hirasola study, or the sunflower study. And uh, this was for uh, looking to see... Um, how heat is affecting agricultural workers because they're at risk for heat related illness symptoms and and also um, with global warming or climate change uh, it's also placing them at, uh, at a higher vulnerability of dying from heat related uh, mortality and um, you know there used to be this statistic from the CDC uh, from 2008 that said that workers agricultural workers were 20 times more likely to, to die from um, heat related uh, injury, but now the statistic is that they're actually 35 uh, times at greater risk for heat-related mortality. So it's only gotten worse. So the aims of the Hira Solar studies was to characterize heat exposure and uh, work activities of uh, agricultural workers. So um, before this, much of the work done with agricultural workers was done like in California on the West Coast and a little bit in uh, North Carolina and some maybe Oregon um, and Washington. So this was kind of like the first time that we were looking at agricultural workers and actually uh, doing some biomonitoring because we knew uh, that workers were suffering from high rates of heat related illness symptoms because they they reported symptoms like dizziness and um, nausea, vomiting, or, and so, uh, but nothing had been actually measured objectively. And so this was one of the first studies to actually measure it objectively. And so we were able to char characterize the physiological response uh, to heat exposure and also determine the extent to which environmental factors, work characteristic, and individual characteristics influence uh, the physiological response of heat. And this right here, this picture is actually of a, fern a fernery worker. So uh, the fern is the, um, the leaf that's on uh, bouquet, the bouquet flowers. And uh, they have to pick 20 of those, bundle them up, and each one of those bundles is 32 cents. So the study used the farm worker vulnerability to heat hazards framework. 
And so what you see here is that at the top, uh, you know, there's environmental heat stress, right? So, uh, you know, it puts everyone at some type of vulnerability. Uh, but you have workplace exposure, which is duration of work and work intensity, sensitivity, which talks about, you know, your age, your gender, your any pre-existing conditions you may have or medications that you may be taking uh, that put you at higher risk. And adaptive capacity, which is like the clothing you're wearing, your work hygiene, hydration status, you know, are there, uh, is there water available at your, um, at, in the fields for you to drink water? Um, sorry. And so all of these three things kind of come together and then you have the response to heat stress. And so we want workers to stay at physiological equilibrium. So we want them to stay under 100.4 or 38 degrees Celsius. So in medicine, you know that once you go over 38 degrees, you have a fever. And, um, and we, want, you know, we don't want workers experiencing symptoms of heat-related illness symptoms. So when one of these um, kind of doesn't work well, let's say, or is off, then that's when uh, physiological disequilibrium happens. So the methods to, um, to monitor the workers was we, we followed them for a baseline visit and then on three work days. Usually they were consecutive work days. And the night before we would give them a core body, a, a core temp ingest, ingestible sensor, which is basically like a pill. And so they would take it the night before, like with dinner, and so in the morning, they would come to the Farm Workers Association off, uh, office, who is our community partner, and uh, we would make sure that they had the sensor uh, basically in their gut uh, with um, uh, another machine that would, you would just put it next to like their abdomen and it would read if the sensor was in there. And we would also put an eye button on them, which was a, this is just a little like key fob that measures the temperature around uh, where they're working at. So they're like microclimate, acelometer to see how, you know, the work intensity and a heart rate monitor that went around their chest. And all of this was underneath their clothes. So you couldn't see it, which is one really huge thing about this study. Uh, is that it's kind of done incognito. The, the employer, the grower, doesn't know that this is happening. Um, that's why we have a community um, partner who really kind of takes care of the community, recruits them. They, the Farm Workers Association of Florida has been around for 30 years advocating for farm workers. And uh, we had been told already that to do research, we needed to do it in a way that you know wasn't wouldn't attract attention. And so this is how... Uh, we were able to do it by putting everything underneath their clothes, coming to the Farm Work Association of office where we would put it on them. And then at the end of the workday, they would come back to the office and we would remove it. And we would collect urine and blood both in the morning and afternoon of their work shifts. And um, at the end of the three days, we would give them their blood results and urine results and give them a little bit of inf health education information and um, their gift cards. So from the Hirasolis study, so while I was a PhD student, you know, the results were coming out of the Hirasolis studies. And we saw that 90% of the agricultural workers exceeded the recommended threshold of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. And 23% of them actually exceeded the 38.5 Celsius, which is 101.3 Fahrenheit. And 43% of them are experiencing two or more heat related symptoms. Half of them, about half of them are dehydrated. So in the morning, before they even start working, half of them are dehydrated. And by the end of the work sh uh, shift, about three quarters of them are uh, dehydrated. And so something we started to notice was that uh, the workers, 33% of the workers had uh, acute kidney injury on at least one work day, which is something that we didn't know was happening. We had already seen some uh, literature coming out from like Central America showing that workers were uh, dying of uh, CKDU, which is chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. We still don't know why that is happening. But uh, this study, along with one in California, were the first two to, to kind of document this, this dysfunction of kidneys happening in agricultural workers. And, and we're trying to figure out what is, um, what is the cause of that. And so one thing we noticed that for 
that the likelihood of having AKI increased 37% for every five degrees in heat index. So the hotter it got, the more likely you were to get acute kidney injury. Um, and so our workers were um, around, the mean was 38 years, um, more female than male. And uh, perhaps one of the reasons is that females tend to be more open to participating in research. And also the agricultural workers in Florida, you're, you're, there's a trend where the males are moving into construction or uh, landscape because it's a little bit, it's paid a little bit better. And so more women are actually going into agriculture. Most of them are from Latin America. Seven years uh, is the mean health, uh, uh, the mean years of education. So, and their uh, body mass, 38 and 39. So they're a little um, on the, uh, a little overweight um, on average. And 12 years working in, in agriculture in the United States is the mean. So we had the Hirasola study. And so based on the findings of, you know, the workers were exceeding core body temperature and also uh, having uh, several symptoms of, of heat stress, um, I did a cooling intervention uh, literature review to see, you know, well, what, what is out there that has been done to help uh, workers, you know, protect workers from heat stress. And so um, that kind of led into my dissertation, which was an intervention pilot study. And so from the cooling review uh, that I did, um, there was only two studies. I was only able to identify two studies that was done with agricultural workers. One was done in Korea and the second one was done in El Salvador. Um, and all of the rest of the studies were either done with uh, construction workers or utility workers, um, but only two with agricultural workers. And there were small studies also. And um, what we found was that in, in at assessing all of these uh, studies, we found that using a combination of interventions seems to uh, be uh, the best way to protect workers from um, having their core body temperature rise. Um, and in the uh, El Salvador study, what they did was, and, and so most of these studies were done in a uh, simulation, in a climatic cha uh, ch chamber. Uh, very few were done actually in the field with workers. So the one in El Salvador was done with workers um, in a few of the construction studies. So, um, so occupational health, Heat-related illness and death, you know, can, perhaps can be mitigated by targeting cooling interventions and uh, behavior and workplace controls among uh, vulnerable occupational groups. So I went back to the framework and, you know, one of the things that we can kind of manipulate is adaptive capacity. Because we don't have a relationship with growers, we haven't been able to develop a relationship with a grower that will, that will actually let us do research on um, at their work site. We can't really change workplace exposure, duration of work, or work intensity, um, and sensitivity is also something very difficult to uh, manipulate. But we can kind of make changes in adaptive capacity, uh, and so that's what we were trying to. This pilot study was really trying to do. Can you know? Can we make enough of a change in the adaptive capacity to help workers stay within a physiological equilib equilibrium. So this is where my uh, dissertation uh, kind of was born from these results and kind of this goal. And so the goal was to determine the feasibility of utilizing cooling, a cooling bandana, cooling vest, or both and uh, determine the effect of these interventions on core body temperature and self-reported heat-related illness symptoms, and also determine the interrelationships of environmental temperature, personal factors, and work characteristics. So this is an actual picture of a fern field in Florida. So the workers there are having lunch, and you can see that they wear these uh, garbage bags uh, to try not to get too wet because of the ferns, and they're having to um, bend down to cut them. But, uh, you know, some of them, like she's wearing a hoodie, uh, they don't wear, you know, jeans, and it's really, really hot in there. And so they say that uh, 
working underneath these uh, tarps, it's actually like 10 degrees hotter in inside those tarps than outside. So very hot, very humid. So in uh, the summers of uh, 2018, 2019, I conducted these pilot studies in Homestead and Pearson, Florida to examine workplace uh, personal cooling gear interventions that could prevent HRI. Um, and one of the big things that uh, the Farm Works Association of Florida said to us was that it, it couldn't, be, the intervention could not interfere with the worker's work routine because if it did, they weren't going to use it. Some of these workers are paid by uh, the piece rate, so uh, it's how much they they cut, or um, and so if it's going to interfere with the the quantity that they're going to uh, cut, that will um, reduce their wages, and so they're they're already making very little money, so to reduce it even more was just not going to work for them. So my pilot um, took a lot of the same methods from the Hirasolis pilot. Um, and so we, again, we, we put on a, um, we measured physical activities to see how hard they're working. We also gave them a core body temperature uh, sensor, which is this right here. And this is what they, the workers would uh, wear on like their belt, kind of like a pager or a cell phone. Uh, that would track their core body temperature every 30 seconds. It would monitor it. It would track it. And it would also, every 30 seconds, would take their heart rate. And so, um, and we did it with just one base, uh, a baseline day, and then one work day. It was not over three days. So it was just one work day. And we did also urine and blood in the morning and afternoon. And uh, we gave them a $50 gift card for participating. Um, and um, we also gave them, those uh, we gave them cooling. We gave cooling bandanas to all the workers that participated in the study, and then we gave them uh, a little. I gave a little bit of health education on how to prevent um, heat stress, and a few I think were referred out to a clinic for um, like high uh, levels of glucose or blood pressure. So the uh, so when the participants. Um, agreed to participate in the study. Uh, they did their informed consent. We randomized them to either the control group, which meant that they would go to work just like they normally do, uh, except that you know, they would be wearing the biomonitoring equipment, the bandana group, the vest group, and the combination group. So the bandana costs around $5. And the way it works is you wet it and then you kind of, you know, um, you squeeze out like the water and then you can put it around your uh, neck or uh, on your forehead. And so you can rewrite it as however many times you want to. Once you don't, once it's no, no longer cooling you, you just rewet it. The vest costs around $200. It weighs about five pounds. And uh, the inserts that go inside last about three to four hours. So they were given a second set that they could exchange once those had melted. So uh, a total of 84 participants underwent uh, randomization. And so we did have a few that dropped out because of child care concerns or transportation issues. And then uh, once we got into the analysis phase of, of the data, uh, there were some participants who had like more than 20% of their core body temperature missing. And so if they had more than 20%, we made the assumption that perhaps something was malfunctioning with the equipment. And so we didn't use that data. So uh, the final analysis for for body temperature was uh, 61 participants. And so here are the overall results. Um, so you can see that their age, they're a little bit older, 40, like early 40s. Um, and most of the groups, so the control group seems to have more females than the other three groups. Um, I want you to notice like their body mass index is also a little bit higher than in the Hira Solis study. And uh, so we had fernery workers, nursery workers, crop workers. Um, years worked in agriculture where uh, 17 years was the average, slightly different with combination and best group. But 
Um, let's see, ambient temperature, were, they were pretty much the same across all four groups. Um, Mid 80s, heat index was high 80s. So it was pretty, it was pretty hot during that time. So here are the results, you know, so one of the first, the first aim was uh, feasibility. Would the workers even use it? And most of the workers did use it. Um, there was uh, the combination group, I believe was the one that had uh, two workers not use it. Um, and they said that they didn't use it because they didn't think it was too hot. It wasn't hot enough for them to use them. Um, but otherwise, the remaining workers all said, you know, many of them said that they found it to be comfortable or a little uncomfortable. I think the vest group and the combination group were the ones that said, you know, the vest was uncomfortable for them. But otherwise, uh, you know, most of them said that they felt like the, the cooling interventions, the cooling gear did help them stay cool and it didn't affect their productivity. So here are the results of their uh, physical activity. So this has 70 of the participants are included in this analysis. And so um, you can see here that, you know, the higher the median of the counts per minute vector magnitude, the more uh, physical activity that they're having, more intense it is. And so the bandana was the lowest, followed by the combination group, and then the control and the vest. And so, but once you look at it also uh, over the course of the work, day, you can kind of uh, see that they pretty much start the same, but the, again, the, the control group and the vest group had the highest uh, physical activity, and so the bandana and control group had lower physical activity. And so right here, this dip that you see here, this is when they're taking their lunch breaks, which can range anywhere from like 10 minutes to 45 minutes. This is something that perhaps in a future study we would want to control more to make sure that like the physical activity is pretty much the same across um, all groups. Um, so here are the summary of symptoms that were reported. So we asked them, you know, uh, some of the typical, you know, more typical symptoms of, of heat stress are excessive sweating, muscle cramps, headaches, nausea, dizziness, confusion, and fading. So nobody fainted in our cohort, which is good. We did have one person who did report confusion on, in the control group. You can see that the bandana group and the combination group, which also had a bandana in it, they're the ones that had the, the fewer types of symptoms reported, uh, while the uh, control and best had a more variety of, of symptoms reported. Now here are our core body temperature uh, results. So, um, the bandana group had the least, uh, um, the lowest proportion of workers who went over 38 degrees, um, and they spent also the least amount of time over uh, 38 degrees. So they spent about 23, medium time was 23 minutes, while the uh, vest group had the highest proportion of workers who went over 38, and also the highest, uh, the medium was 53 minutes over 38 degrees. So um, that was really interesting uh, for us because we were actually expecting the VEST group to have a lower, <laughs> uh, to have uh, more people stay underneath 38 than, uh, than this, what this showed. So when we looked at, we did the logistic regression to see the odd ratios of exceeding uh, core body temperature. And so the unadjusted, you can see that bandana seems to be protective. Um, it's not statistically significant, but, um, you know, it's encouraging, right? Uh, the vest group and the combination group actually, like, made it worse. And then we went and adjusted for uh, BMI, heat index, um, years in agriculture, hours worked, and uh, those you know, working in moderate to vigorous activity. And the bandana still kept, uh, you know, kept his hold on being protective, whereas the vast and combination group, uh, you know, seemed to make it worse even after controlling for those uh, factors. And so um, I think that one of the reasons um, that the vest did not do as well as we thought is that, um, as you saw, they have higher BMI. So I think that 
you know, they wear the vats. Let me show you a picture. Okay. So there's a layer of clothing and sometimes two layers of clothing. Sometimes they wear two shirts. Um, and then, you know, they have extra ad adipose tissue. So I think that that may be one of the reasons. The other reason is that as the, um, as the uh, ice melted, um, it started to weigh them down. Many of the workers expressed that, that it, you know, it was kind of heavy. Um, so I think that they were having to perhaps work a little bit harder to carry that extra five pounds. Um, and that's another reason why uh, it didn't work as well as we thought it would. The, the bandana you know, is very lightweight, and so they would put it around their neck. So I think that having that pull sensation right next to like these huge uh, blood vessels that we have on our, around our neck probably helped um, also because it's direct contact with the skin and not extra uh, weight that they're having to carry around. Um, and so um, this, uh, my pilot study was funded by four uh, grants, two from the NIOSH um, ERC from North Carolina and Florida and the uh, American Association of Occupational Health Nurses and the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. And so, from the year of solar studies, you know, I did the cooling intervention, um, and I mentioned earlier that we noticed that there was some uh, acute kidney injury happening. And so we did a, I did a, a literature search uh, about uh, CKDU and AKI in, in um, workers. And so from the literature search, we found that uh, there are several hypotheses um, that are being kind of discussed as to why CKDU is happening. There's um, some who say that this may be the first, you know, disease from climate change. Others think, think it's uh, related to pesticides, heavy metals, or uh, infectious disease like lep leptospirosis. Um, but everybody seems to think or kind of agree that perhaps it's a combination of several things happening that, are, that is causing these agricultural workers to get uh, chronic kidney disease. So it's multifactorial. Um, what we do see is uh, rises in, in creatinine and uh, low um, glomerular filtration rate. Um, we see a little bit of electrolyte uh, abnormal abnormalities. And what's interesting is that they don't really have proteinuria in their urine. It's, if they do have some, it's trace, it's very minimal. So that's also kind of puzzling as to why, you know, what is happening with these, uh, the kidneys of these workers. So our research group now has another grant trying to study uh, biomarkers and acute kidney injury in uh, the agricultural workers. And so this study actually just started in January of this year, and I'm kind of the field director of the study. And so we enrolled about, uh, we enrolled 118 participants to follow them over the course of two years uh, to see how their kidney function kind of progresses through those uh, two years. Um, and so we are doing uh, a, uh, a baseline work day, I'm sorry, a baseline and one work day. And so we take, again, urine, blood, the pre-work shift and after work shift. And we started also, the community started telling us that they wanted to know about like their lipids and they wanted to know, know their A1Cs um, because this community doesn't have a lot of access to healthcare. And sometimes we are like the first people that they interact um, in healthcare or to have like any type of health screening done. Uh, so we started to implement the A1C and cardio check for them to kind of incentivize them to participate in the study and remain in the study. Uh, but we're also, you know, we're freezing a lot of blood and urine to make, you know, a better analysis, of trying to figure out what's going on with the, uh, the kidneys. But from doing what the, listening to the community, um, we, uh, we saw that many of the workers, Oh, there's a, a high rate of workers with elevated glucose levels. So the median fasting serum glucose was 110. And 13% of the workers had an A1C above uh, between 5.7 and 6.4, which is pre-diabetes. Uh, there was only two workers that had uh, above 6.4. Uh, 
And so none of these workers knew that they fell in the pre-diabetes kind of uh, category. Uh, and so one of the um, hypotheses that has uh, been discussed about CKDU or kidney dysfunction in workers is that uh, glucose metabol metabolism perhaps is involved in kidney injury and that perhaps the workers are they're dehydrated, right? And so instead of rehydrating with like water, uh, they're rehydrating with lot with drinks that contain fructose. And so there have been some you know studies with animals, rats that kind of show that when uh, the the rats are giving uh, high fructose beverages and dehydrated, that they have kidney injury. And so I am right now. Uh, preparing a grant uh, for an F32 to, to, to look at what the workers are drinking um, and in trying to see if was there some type of association with uh, the way the body responds uh, as far as like heat stress and uh, renal function to what they're drinking and what associations are there. Um, here are my aims. So we're gonna be looking at inflammatory markers um, but and also continue using that same biomonitoring um, method that we we've been using of, of measuring core body temperature, heart rate, dehydration, HRI, which I think is very important, um, and also using metabolomics to try to analyze this a little bit better. And so the what well, what I'm proposing is that you know there's heat stress and dehydration. And so they rehydrate with sugary drinks, specifically like the ones that, that contain fructose, which causes an increase in blood glucose, which would then uh, activate vasopressin and the um, fructose pathways, which then causes an increase in sorbitol, which increases fructose. And that is when that happens, when there's an increase in fructose, that's what causes a little bit, uh, you can see acute kidney injury, but also... Uh, causes oxidative stress, which is also activated by being dehydrated and osmotic stress to the kidney cortex. And then the increase in glucose also blunts um, IL-6, which, you know, too high IL-6 is bad, but there is, uh, if when there's too much sugar, it there isn't that rise. There's a rise in IL-6 that's good uh, because then uh, heat shock protein 72 kind of starts and, and, and it's a, it's protective. But if the body doesn't detect enough rise of the IL-6, heat shock protein will not um, will not get activated. And so I think that that's when, or I'm proposing that that's when a heat-related illness symptoms and acute kidney injury, all of this kind of synergizes comes together and this is what happens. So um, I will let you guys know what I find out. And um, lastly, I just want to thank my wonderful group of advisors uh, that helped me through my dissertation and now as a postdoc and our community partners, the Farm Workers Association of Florida. And lastly, just to remind you that farm workers, agricultural workers, we feed you and heat related morbidity and mortality is preventable and vulnerable occupational groups merit protections. And so questions. That was super, Rosanna. Thank you so much. Um, we have questions from Adrian Wald, lots of them. Um, and I, I had some of the same questions. So what was the sample size of Girasoles? 248. Okay. And um, how, did you, how do you know that they wore the vests? The question was about intervention fidelity. Was it Self-report, or did you actually have something embedded in there that? Yeah, it was self-reported. Okay. And that's the thing that we, um, you know, they they could have lied to us um, just to make us happy. Um, so, the, yeah, yeah, there's, you know, not being able to have a relationship with the grower really limits us with that. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a really great study, especially for dissertation work. And I'm really glad I didn't get to hear you give the talk at Emory. So now I get to hear it here. Um, and yeah, Adrian, do you want to ask some of your questions? Or do you want me to? Yeah, she's typing. Can't. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> are the vests used for other purposes widely? Um, athletes use them. Oh. So, uh, so you in in, in soccer uh, sometimes the the athletes will you know and once they get out they uh, want to go down. Um, some marathon cyclists have used them. And then I know that in Qatar, you know, they're building the stadium for the next World Cup, and construction workers there are, are using them. There's no research going on, but uh, it's been given to them to use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adrian Wald says that she studies athletes in exertional heat. So, yeah, she was wondering. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's have you ever, you have not seen any of these cooling vests in agricultural workers used before? Or is this the first time? Um, so this specific, um, th this was uh, the first time it was used with agricultural workers in the real world setting. There was the one study done in Korea done for like 90 minutes in a climate chamber, which I think isn't really representative of what the workers are dealing with, like in the real world. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I also wanted. That, uh, well, this is Luce's comment that um, that she loves your community engaged approach, which I, I think is really excellent. That you had a, like a community advisory board, and you knew that you had to kind of hide the the, the equipment underneath their shirts. Um, but with the vests, they could see that the people were wearing the vests, right? So there was right. that they had to get permission from the owners of the fields, right? So the workers, you know, we told the workers that if they had any problems, they could just remove the vest. Most of the workers said that um, their, their bosses didn't say anything, or if they did, they would just say, oh, I'm wearing it because they pull and they were left alone. Um, some of them made comments like, you know, you're wearing a, a bulletproof vest or things yes. like that. You know, they start joking around each other. Yeah. But no one has issues. So. And Adrian, I'm just going to be, I'm just channeling Adrian here. Um, did you control for hydration status at all? You did check the, you said you checked the the, the urine before they went out, right? And they... And afterwards. And um, we did put that in one of my models that we didn't show here, and it didn't seem to affect it. Yeah. Um, any, anybody else have any other questions that they want to ask um, by unmuting your mics, if you can? I was wondering, um, I had a question that I was wondering if, because they were wearing these cooling vests, did, did they, oh, their activity wasn't greater, was it? Then the, they didn't have greater activity. You showed the velocity. Yeah, they did. The, the, the vests and the, the vest, uh, and the control of fire and because I was just thinking if you're wearing this cooling thing, then maybe, you know, you, you work harder, you're able to, to do, you know, you've got this perception that, okay, I feel, I feel cooler. I can work longer and harder and I can sweat more and I can, you know, and so then their core body temperature, you know, goes up because they're actually um, able to, to tolerate the heat more. Um, anyway, like the, the opposite effect of, you know, kind of what you, in your final models that um, you thought that that would be something that would reduce their core temperature, but maybe if they don't perceive their core temperature is going up and they feel cooler, they keep working harder and sweating more. And Yeah, I, um, I, I was also thinking about that. Um, but I think that the cooling vest, so the participants said, you know, the but if we only use it, like our rates. You're kind of going in and out on the audio. I don't know why. Oh, um, I don't know. Is this better? Yeah, it's good. Okay. 
the participants, you know, told us during the exit interviews that the vest would be during their breaks or like lunch breaks, not while they're working, because they felt that uh, it was too heavy. And then once it like was halfway melted, there was a part that felt hotter to them because of the plastic. Um, so there's probably some of that going on as well. Yeah, I think like a different, yeah, Adrian says a different vest design, like something really lightweight, maybe reflective, you know, that's a, a, a cooling material. Um, uh, I, I Something that's, it seems to me like that may be a design. Yeah. You know, like I, I know that there, you know, I've worked with biotech um, students um, in uh, when I was at Berkeley and they would, uh, you know, undergrads would, you know, get together with a researcher and, and the researcher say, I have this tech problem. And then they would design a prototype. And, you know, so it'd be kind of like, can you prototype with somebody as, you know, I think we might have this uh, bioengineering program at Emory that help with that but I, you're on to the p pathophysiology now of of um the <laughs> so but um yeah so um i you know I, my work in guatemala right now where we are a lot of the participants go to the coffee plantations to um make money during the harvesting season and then they come back to their community and that's how they make their money um have you seen anything in the literature about i know they say the sugar cane and in central America, anything on the coffee coffee plantations and the harms around but i think it's a little bit cooler and they're in the mid region so maybe it's not such a hot harvest yeah i have not seen anything um, it's been most interesting and like the low level. Yeah, yeah. We've had a lot of um, issues with our participants that come back from the coffee fields and tell us these stories about, you know, how they're in the fields and they're picking coffee and, and their hands are, you know, filthy from what's on, you know, the coffee and the chemicals that are sprayed on the coffee and they don't have any hand washing facilities and then they end up having to eat their food with their hands that they can't wash. And so there's just like so many issues around the way agricultural workers and, you know, that's there. And then if they come here and then are going to work in, you know, on the tomato plantations in Florida, you know, they probably think they're, they've arrived at something somewhat better that they, that they came from or what, what, do you, what's your feeling? I, or, I, like sometimes some of the workers say that the working conditions here are perhaps worse. Than okay. <laughs> yeah, because they're they're pretty stuck. Yeah. 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 I know, and it's it's not on their own. Yeah, it's interesting. I just feel like a cross comparison. You know, something looking at um, what what their experience is there and what their experience is here, because with the CKDU being the Mesoamerican phenomena that may be what is going on there. And then, then it's just, you know, um, and I know Daniel's on, uh, he got on the line too. So that he did, um, that's his area of research as well. So. Yeah. I think he's doing it at Grady, right? With him. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, I don't know. I don't want to hog up the airtime, but Luz, do you have any questions? I um I love that your research might show that the low cost intervention for the time being, I mean, obviously bigger studies might be helpful, but the low cost intervention was really the biggest option. And five dollars is a little more affordable than two hundred dollars. So I don't know if you can speak to how you might have shared that information with the the agricultural workers. So if they felt that five dollars might be something to invest from your findings, were you able to report that back to the Farm Workers Association? Yeah. So the we so what's good about the Farm Workers Association of Florida is that they're really big on giving the communities the communities back the results 
Um, and so they hold events where they they share the results finding and they do it in a way that, you know, the community can understand instead of like this kind of very sophisticated scientific way that we sometimes do. Um, so yes, we do um, share the results with the workers and, you know, it, it should really be the employers who are providing these uh, protective equipment to the workers and that's like something that I think that we need to do in the future is perhaps you know start looking at, at cost analysis uh, but we would need a grower to allow us to be on their fields and do research and a lot of them are very resistant to it I don't think they're as resistant in in California but over on this side of the world they are uh, it's, I think that if we could do a cost analysis kind of study, that's that would be something good for advocacy organizations to use to empower them to try to advocate for uh, that equipment. Um, do you know about the labor and occupational health program at in California? Uh, it's in UC Berkeley. Um, it's um, they've done a lot of work with the strawberry growers and kind of workers' rights, kind of like OSHA. It's called mm -hmm. HP, and um, it's actually run by a, a friend of mine who's half Bolivian, so Luz is half Bolivian. So, <laughs> and she does occupational health of um, working with farm workers, but in California, and I just think it would be interesting because they did a lot on cooling, you know, creating cooling tents and cooling stations. And after a, a pregnant woman died, um, you know, in the fields. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it would be interesting to look and see what kind of things they're doing that they might have materials that you could share with the workers that you work with. Um, so. Have they published on that? No, I think it's more of like an uh, advocacy. Uh, they're more occupational health and less research. Okay. Uh, yeah, more policy work. So, um, but Suzanne Turan is the name of the person who runs the program. And okay. yeah, you should, they, they, I know they have a lot of like information in Spanish. Actually, they have, and then there's a, a Salvadoran woman who works with her named Denora Barton. Um, okay. she's also there, um, but they do a lot of good work and mostly with Spanish speaking populations there. Um, anything else? Anybody want to make any more, ask any questions or anything? Silence is okay. I'll just, I'll just say it was interesting when you were really seeing the work of the team from the get-go to now, and so I enjoyed seeing the overview. You did a good job, Roxana. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Luz, do you want to make any announcements? We have actually, we sent out with our newsletter, um, Elizabeth Murphy is asking for people to sign up um, to uh, to be a part. I don't know. Luz, you want to explain a little more? Yes. In our newsletter, we um, have an opportunity to collaborate with the education work group where if you are a nurse researcher doing environmental work, that you share your bio with them and they're going to highlight these nurse research activities within the Annie e-text. So they're going to kind of tie together some of these real um, research efforts with nurse scientists. So the deadline for that is July 26th. So you have like three more days to get those in. I think it's very brief. If you look in our newsletter, I put it right underneath um, Dr. Chica's um, bio. So um, it's something that I think it would be great if people can kind of chip in and share their efforts. I think you're muted still, Lisa. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll give you five minutes of time back and thank you so much for um, 
uh, giving us a, a super clear presentation. I really enjoyed it. Roxana, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll send out our another newsletter for next um, next month's meeting. And thank you very much for being our guest speaker. We thank hope you. you can join us next time so that we can try to build the environmental health nursing kind of, although this research group doesn't just do environmental health, but yes, I think I do tend to do that. So maybe we're, um, you know, focusing on that a little bit more, but please join us for future meetings. Okay. Yes. Roxanne, it was great. I'm really glad you joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.